Welcome everyone. This is an informational webinar about the ARDC uh, program called Institutional Underpinnings. I'm Adrian Burton. We also have Nicola Burton, absolutely no relative, just a coincidence, and uh, Keith Russell. Uh, we're all from the ARDC and we'll be talking to you about different aspects of the program. Uh, we will be having uh, questions and answers a little bit later in the um, webinar. If you do have any, make sure that you uh, note them in the questions pod of the uh, GoToWebinar thing. Do we have a slide that shows that? If not, you'll see. Uh, uh, we, we don't, but it'll be in, in that um, GoToWebinar panel. Good. So if you think of questions whilst the presentation is going on, uh, just get in there and uh, note them down there and we'll read through those and go answer those questions afterwards. Um, I think we'll go on to the next slide. Thanks, Nicola. So the ARDC is an NCRIS facility, part of the National Research Infrastructure for Australia. Uh, we are funded therefore through the uh, Department of Education to provide uh, national level um, services and facilities. The ARDC itself has a wide range of uh, activities and themes that uh, we're a very holistic organisation and we really look at the full life cycle and the full um, holistic approach to data and digi digital infrastructure. So everything from uh, policy, uh, people and policy, software and uh, analytical platforms. We invest a lot in coordination and coherence of the, the whole system. We provide storage and compute services uh, and underpinning infrastructure and uh, we have uh, data and services. It's that last uh, little uh, box there, the circle data and services that we're talking about today. So let's um, go on to the next slide, Nicola. This pro we have a program in ARDC which is a co-investment program. The ARDC has a strategy for building the Australian Research Data Commons and we have this program where we co-invest uh, with a number of players to build the uh, national data system. The, pro the National Data Assets Program uh, is a program to build up exactly as it says, national data assets that will support uh, leading edge research for Australia. There's a number of programs in that, uh, in this initiative, the national data assets. Uh, some of them are targeted at particular stakeholder groups, the other NCRIS facilities, uh, some, some to do with public sector data, um, some to do with well-established collections, others with the emerging, we have a health studies program. This particular program is institutional underpinnings and it targets our, the Australian university sector and the capability and capacity of that sector to support uh, the national data system. So on our next slide, uh, why do we have a national data assets program in the first place? Well, uh, as part of NCRIS, that is what uh, NCRIS is about. It's about establishing those national level significant uh, assets and facilities and services. That's what a, an NCRIS facility is. And it really uh, focuses at what can be done only at the, at the national level for uh, to achieve a particular scale or scope. Um, and that is well and truly above the, the capacity of a, any single jurisdiction or institution or local arrangement. So when we're talking about data as an infrastructure, we're, we're targeting the uh, assets that, that are focused in, uh, that, that will support leading edge research is our first mandate to, and then secondly, to uh, make sure that those are the ones that are uh, addressed at national level. So on our next slide, the, the, if we look at the whole sort of system, it's more like a rather than a system, it's an ecosystem, it sort of lives together. Uh, if we start at the bottom there, you've got a whole set of 
institutions, research institutions, government agencies, utilities and national facilities. They are creating a whole set of data, a whole lot of data as part of their normal operations. So as the operations of a, of a public sector organization or as a, the operations of a research organization, you create research data. Some of the, that research data builds up to be big community collections and some of them build up to be these very big tall timbers and national uh, reference collections. Normally the ARDC focus is at the, uh, at the level of those uh, collections that can only exist beyond any single jurisdiction or any single uh, research institution. And the, the rest of our National Data Assets Program focuses those national collections that need very broad partnerships and need actually a little bit of Commonwealth investment to, to glue together something which is well beyond the scope of any uh, single institution. So that's partly to say to you what this program is not about. Uh, as part of the portfolio approach to uh, national data assets, all our other programs focus uh, on these reference and community collections. This program, however, and if you want to click the next slide there, Nicola, it focuses down at this operation. So the operations of our universities, as they're doing research, they're creating research data, and the institutional underpinnings uh, really focuses on that. So why do we do that? That's on our next slide. There is a reason, even though we are a national program, the operational, the, the local infrastructure is, is super important because those big trees actually have their roots back down in the institutions. The, the national data collections actually depend on the institutional resources and culture. And without a healthy uh, institutional uh, capacity, uh, it would be very, very difficult for us to pursue those programs of these large uh, reference and community collections. So that's the first thing is that all our other programs leverage the, the health and the capacity of our institutions. And then secondly, uh, one of our goals is also to, at a, at a systematic level, at, a, at the level of the national data system and of the national research system, we are um, aiming to support research efficiency and research integrity. And those things happen with a healthy set of good capable institutions, then the data that underpins the very important publications in Australia, that data is all held uh, by our um, research institutions and a healthy uh, capacity at our institutions will make a, a, a systematic contribution to integrity and efficiency. So that's why we're doing it. But uh, what, we're, what we're then uh, faced with is, OK, then how does a national program actually invest in institutional capacity when actually what we're meant to be doing is, that's the very definition of what we're meant to be doing is not investing at the institutional level. So uh, we did a little bit of homework on that. So we acknowledge the absolute dependency on healthy institutions for the national system. Uh, but then how do you do that investing? So we did a little bit of thought in that. And in last year, we ran a, a set of discovery programs in a number of areas. And one of them was exactly in this area as to um, what is a national approach to building the capacity and the capability of our institutions. And Keith was uh, the sort of manager of that program, so I think he'll talk to us a little bit about that now. Thanks, Adrian. Yes, yeah, so uh, indeed we we sort of, we had a co-investment partnership uh, uh, with a research data culture conversation project, which ran in 2019-2020. So this project was led by um, a steering committee, a steering group, uh, was led by Monash University, University of Melbourne, University of Sydney, and UNSW. So the main trigger behind this project was the fact that these universities were having to deal with a growing volume of data that their researchers were producing, and they were having to make decisions about retention or disposal of that data as storage was filling up. So this was definitely one of the large triggers for this project. And in this project, they went around the country and organised a number of uh, public consultations to collect views from a whole range of different Australian universities 
what is happening in the research data management landscape and what are things that could be improved to, to achieve this future. So a um, few things came out of this, uh, well, a whole range of different things came out of this. You'll find links there at the bottom to the, the summary of the challenges that they identified and also a, um, um, a development response that they drafted and provided. So definitely have a read there, this really interesting uh, uh, views collected there. So a few, a few things that uh, certainly for me stood out, uh, I think that they envisaged a future in which the cost of making decisions about data and data life cycles would be reduced. So they'd actually have that information to make decisions about data, whether to keep it or whether to dispose of it. Um, also to achieve, have a future with a, with a cultural change in it, in which researchers can actually articulate what kind of data has what kind of end of life events. So a university can easier make the, more easily make those decisions. One of the other things that DEF came out in a range of those different uh, consultation sessions is that um, achieving those changes, being ready for that future requires increased coordination uh, of research data management across the university. There's no one pillar or part of the university that can solve this on their own. It's much more uh, a coordinated effort that is required across the university. So if you look at their recommendations, which you can find uh, more, uh, you can find more detail about them in the development response, a number of these recommendations we are now carrying forward in the institutional underpinnings program. Not all of them, some of them are in other areas, but um, uh, a number of these uh, we definitely do are picking off here in institutional underpinnings. So one of the things they recommended, they said, well, it would be good to look at what would a next generation research data management framework life cycle look like. So that's one of the things would definitely uh, we will be carried forward. Um, when, if you have that framework, what are actually best practice guidelines to do parts of those elements in those frameworks? One other point they raised uh, um, and came out of their consultations is that different domains have different data workflows and, different and require different decision points. So you'll need to take that into account when designing, uh, when designing an institutional-wide research data management framework. So those are, I think, a few points that, that we're carrying forward in this uh, in this program. So uh, Nicola, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So as, as Adrian mentioned, we are looking at a national investment, looking at the national scale and looking to achieve a shared national approach to the institutional management, sharing, retention and disposal of research data. So that's going to require a a common agreed framework with input, coordinated input from a whole range of different universities. So that's what that's one of the pieces of the puzzle. But if if we develop, if all our all our universities together develop such a framework, um, it's still got to it still will have to fit in the to the practice of that of the different universities. And there is of course quite a bit of variation between universities. So just developing a framework on itself on its own is not enough, it's also going to have to fit and going to be going to be validated and tested in practice at a range of different universities to see if it works in practice. So that's why as part of the institutional underpinnings we also see uh, a step in having coordinated validation and implementation of elements of the framework to see if they work in practice and also adjust the framework to ensure that it does meet that variation across universities. So that's a bit of a high level oversight overview of institutional underpinnings. Uh, Nicola uh, is the actual program lead for uh, this program, so I'll hand over to her and she'll talk all about the details. Brilliant, thanks Keith. Um, so I'll start with a, a sort of a broad view. Um, so uh, our aim is to develop, as um, Keith has said, a coordinated and collegially informed approach to RDM across Australia's universities. So our participants are Australian universities and um, we're expecting participation at the institutional level. Uh, we'll be co-investing $65,000 per participating university and the project will start um, at the start of next year uh, with an 18 month duration and there'll be a two stage application process, which I'll go into more detail about in a little bit. Um, so as we've discussed, uh, this is going to be one collaborative project in which all participating universities uh, jointly create an institutional level framework for the management, sharing, retention and disposal of data. And our aims for this framework are 
that it should inform universities' design of policy, procedures, infrastructure and services required for IDM, uh, improve the coordination of IDM both within and between institutions, and also help to identify the information that's needed for more efficient decision making around retention and disposal of research data, as um, was discussed in that uh, research data conversation piece. So um, this joint framework uh, will be developed collaboratively by the participating institutions, but we have some um, thoughts about what uh, we'd like to see in that framework. Uh, so one thing would be a joint statement of the principles underpinning effective institutional research data management. Um, also an outline of the policies, procedures, services, and infrastructure that are needed for effective research data management. The shared, a shared profile of the archival principles appropriate to research data management and a model of the common decisions and events that occur as research data interacts with each of these elements, um, including where possible the information that feeds into those decisions and processes. So again, getting us towards that place where we can reduce the cost of those decisions. <laughs> And just to be clear, um, the framework is not intended to be a specific technology solution. We're looking for something that's technology agnostic. Uh, it's not going to be defining a single set of standards or metadata standards. Um, it's not a prescribed policy, although it could be used to inform the design or redesign of policy at an institution. Um, and it's not intended to be a solution for just one discipline or one university. As we've been saying, this is about something that can be applied for all of Australia's universities. So the framework will be developed in three stages. In the first stage, all participating universities will collaboratively develop a draft framework. And then in stage two, as Keith uh, suggested, there'll be um, each individual institution will select just an aspect of that framework and um, implement it locally to test and validate it. And then the feedback from those implementations, we fed back in to uh, finalise the framework. So when we talk about implementations, these um, are, so as I said, activities within an institution that, that test or validate an aspect of the framework, and they must um, have ongoing value beyond the duration of the project. Um, they should also involve improvement or change at the institution, so not just business as usual, but um, we're definitely happy for implementations to develop or um, leverage uh, current changes or improvements that are in place or are planned. Um, obviously they should be specifically related to the joint framework and ideally they should also produce some output that can be of value to other institutions, um, although that could take a range of different forms. So for instance, we could be talking about uh, code for a specific tool, we could be talking about um, guidelines for the um, set up of a particular piece of software or um, recommendations about uh, say a training program. Um, as well as developing an implementation, um, participating universities are expected to attend regular meetings and workshops um, during the drafting of the framework, uh, to consult within your institution, because as we've said, um, this process is going to involve input from uh, a wide range of different parts of the university, uh, contribute to the drafting of a section of the framework, and also provide feedback to the framework as a whole. Uh, so in the past, our co-investment programs have, in, have required a one-to-one -one, uh, matching co-investment from institutions um, or other partners, um, but we're very aware that um, in the current pandemic situation, uh, it's causing a lot of financial difficulties for our partners and therefore uh, we won't be requiring that one-to-one -one matching co-investment. However, given the close alignment between this program and activities um, in research data management development that are going on at the institutions, we really do expect um, that uh, there'll be the capacity for uh, in-kind co-investment or other co-investment, as well as the leveraging of existing activities. So as I said, it's a two-stage application process. So in the first stage, um, interested institutions will uh, register your interest, so that opens from next week, and all institutions that register their interest will participate in a consultative workshop in which we'll uh, collectively further refine the aims and scope of the framework, as well as talking about the practical running of the project. Um, after that workshop, participating institutions will be invited to formally apply to participate. Um, 
and that will open in December and uh, close in February. As I said, we're expecting just one application per institution. Um, and because this program will uh, require coordination and consultation within the university at both stages of the application process, uh, we require that you're able to name relevant contacts just within your institution uh, who represent the important parts of the university that will be contributing to the project. So uh, for instance, representatives from uh, the research office, IT, uh, e-research, um, records and archives, whichever parts of the university are helping to contribute towards research data management management. Uh, it's actually um, going to be quite a brief um, application. Uh, there's no requirement for a formal proposal or budget, but we will be asking at the application stage for you to outline potential areas in which you might be interested in implementing the framework. Now, obviously, because the implementation is an implementation of a framework that you will be developing as part of the program, um, we won't be holding anyone to the suggestions that they make during the application stage, uh, but it will help us to get an idea of the spread of areas of interest across participating institutions and whether there's any overlap in institutions who may be able to work in parallel or collaboratively. And um, I think back to Adrian. Sure. So this diagram comes from the um, National Infrastructure Roadmap. It has the national research infrastructure in the middle there and interacting with the public sector, the private sector, with research institutions. Um, so it's that this little arrow here that this program really fits into. It's the arrow between national research infrastructure and research institutions and really um, designing that in, in our case, you know, our, as we've said, we acknowledge our national research data collections infrastructure leverages and depends and, 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 uh, on, on a healthy research institutional uh, infrastructure and culture. And so this program is that, that uh, is us really trying to design that interface between the national infrastructure and the uh, institutional infrastructure in a really uh, sensible way. Of course, the so what is that all of this together is, of course, meant you know not just to create more infrastructure and better, uh, better research in that uh, in its own right. Uh, the, the arrow to the right there says that you know we are obviously doing this in order to improve food security, improved health, longevity, and uh, carbon emissions, etc. So we will be looking. You know, this is a very fundamental program about the capacity of institutions and how they fit into national infrastructure. But we will be wanting to tease out, you know, what, you know, and what does this, you know, how how can we draw the line towards uh, improved research and how that research then impacts um, society. I think we only have one more um, slide, and I think that was a summary of the objectives of the. Uh, you know, this is really just to to wrap up what we've already said here that we are looking to why is ARDC making these investments? We're investing in a national coordinated and coherent approach to research data management at universities. Um, and then with supporting two sy systemic improvements uh, to research integrity and quality so that all the, um, if there is an, an uplift in the capacity of our institutions, then all the data that underpins uh, research conclusions will have integrity because the data is there uh, and well managed and kept when it should be kept and destroyed when it should be destroyed. Um, and the second one is a systemic improvement to innovation and excellence by um, being able to build from these uh, solid institutional processes, being able to build um, distributed collections, national collections, uh, contributions from the institutions into these, uh, um, the reuse of data and therefore the, the um, sort of increases in return on investment and innovation that that can bring. So that's what we're trying to do through this humble little program. We're trying to change the world. Um, but, uh, and we're really very excited about this opportunity to um, have a uh, take our relationship with the universities in Australia to the next level. We've uh, 
uh, always pride ourselves on having a very holistic approach to what's needed for an Australian research data commons and we acknowledge the important place that the universities play and we're really looking forward to um, learning with the, the, the sector on what the best institutional underpinning for a research data commons actually is. I think we might be ready for questions. And um, we do have a few. I can um, I can uh, take the first couple uh, because uh, yes, this uh, session will be recorded, and the uh, it is um, the recording will be put up, and uh, the slides will also be made available. Um, okay. To what extent are you intending to align those principles with the guidance provided in the Australian Code RDM guidelines, which most institutions have used to revise their policies in recent times? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, absolutely. They're meant to be uh, one of the objectives of this program is to, uh, when I said those systemic improvements to integrity, the, remember that code comes under the code for the, for the responsible conduct of research. Um, and this program in one sense is meant to be is our contribution to try and uh, get a really coherent response to that code. and uh, to make sure that each university has the opportunity to implement and validate some of the um, the requirements that, that are in that code. Now, uh, the code is more general, however, it doesn't uh, necessarily... Okay, uh, there has been a lot of... Oh. Oops, sorry, yeah, we're on a bit of a delay. Just an, uh, an addendum to that question, we intend to go further than the code. The code is a now I'm going to quote that famous pirate from the from the Pirates of the Caribbean. It's more like a, a set of guidelines. Um, so and actually it is. In, uh, actually it's called a, a guideline for data management. Is that, that that guideline there? And it sets out you know a university should have a, 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 a infrastructure. It should have policies. It should have support. Um, it should take into consideration the value of the data, etc. So what we're hoping with this program is to be able to take that down to just a profile uh, uh, of detail. You know, what what will you take into account when you're making a decision to keep data, and how will you make those decisions, and what what information do you need to collect in the life cycle so that you can make those decisions of keeping important data for integrity or for innovation. Um, or for contributions to national collections, so that those that we really have a, a, an operationalization, if you like, of the of the guideline. Okay. Um, there has been a lot of investment at the institutional level in research data management over the past five years, including via ANS programs. How will the proposed program build on what has already been achieved? Keith, do you have any thoughts on that? You, as, a, as one of the leaders of the ANS, you know, institutional engagements programming? Um, I think we'll, we'll definitely be building building on uh, what has already been, been put in place at institutions. And uh, in that institutional research data management framework, I'm not expecting anything that is going to be contrary to those uh, to uh, to activities that have already been set up and been developed in those in those earlier projects uh, i think rather this is going to be a more holistic uh, uh, bringing together of different elements which have been developed in the past and getting a more integrated approach across them that's my expectation Okay, uh, can you talk about your expectations of the workshop on the 19th of November? So just that uh, post-registration workshop. I think we'd like to go into some uh, more details about the, um, on, you know, we've talked to you about our framework, you know, how, how, how that might be developed, you know, some of the timelines uh, that, that would be involved there the kinds of participation that we might be uh, being that might be being involved um, also um, teasing out you know what an implementation might be uh, some of those things uh, can unis partner to bundle their co-investment and how might we staff a role and align activities
that was to bundle with another university, do you think is that is that the question? Combined together? Uh, absolutely, that's part of why we've got this um, iterative design, the co-design and a number of those workshops, the first of which will be in November, but there'll be a number of those um, is to be able to identify where there are common interests um, in some aspect of research data management might be a research data management planning tool or something that several universities might want to make changes to or improve. Um, so yes, that, that's part of what the, we will be actively coordinating some of these implementations. Um, uh, to, to clarify, uh, there's the intention is that there'll be no um, lead uh, node or that we'll be contracting individually with each participating institution, but um, arrangements between the institutions to um, collaboratively, for instance, uh, staff a role. I think that, that makes perfect sense for us. Um, Will more details on how we align our revised RDM policy guidance material to the national strategy or is part of the joint framework initial discussions? Will there, is that very, will there be more details perhaps on how we align I our- I think that's the intention, yes. Uh, RDM policy guidance materials to the national strategy or is it part of the joint framework initial discussions? Yes. Look, I think we'd be looking for the framework to distill the essence of current and desired um, uh, institutional RDM policy. Uh, so we would be looking at the uh, at, uh, a national framework is what we can say together and then uh, each institution would obviously implement that uh, in in the ways and with the priorities of the of the local institution. I'm not sure if that was exactly the question, but happy to take more. Yes, um, if the question answer um, asker would like to clarify if they have anything else they want to know. Um, I have a comment here. Um, the funding is welcome, but is it enough to move us forward? Yes. We can always do more with more money. Um, if, you, if you see the Minister for Education, you can put in a good, good word for the ARDC now. <laughs> um, and look, uh, we're hoping that this might be able to catalyze and it certainly wouldn't be, it's not the end of our, our investments in this area. Um, will it be enough to carry us forward? We're hoping it's enough to invest at least in the first stage of coordination and coherence amongst the institutions. Um, and we will keep in mind that this is a two-way conversation. If the universities can communicate to us, you know, what some bigger opportunities might be, um, then we can communicate that back to the Department of Education as to saying, well, here's a new opportunity in the, the national investment to uh, invest in the capability of the institutions. I have another one. Uh, what engagement with Cordit is happening with this program? Good question. I don't think we've reached out specifically yet to the different peak bodies. Uh, Nicola mentioned the different pillars that we were probably expecting to be involved in from the different from universities. She mentioned, you know, IT, the research office, library, the archives and e research. Each of those have their um, sort of coordinating peak bodies and we would definitely, um, we definitely anticipate that the, the peak bodies will be there to, to back up the, that because this is a joint statement uh, that they would be there to uh, to um, represent the joint interests of, of the IT directors and the university librarians. So um, I think it's a really good opportunity actually to um, bring that coherence in by including the peak bodies. We haven't done that yet, but it's a good, a good reminder that we should reach out more formally. Um, so there's one here that I'll take. Um, 
do you have a provisional time frame for each phase of the program? Uh, yes, we do. So um, the provisional plan is that um, there'll be uh, six months in that initial um, draft framework development phase, nine months for the implementations, and then three months for the feedback and finalisation. Um, but that timeline is something that um, we'd love to get feedback on in that um, initial workshop um, to get a sense of uh, the practicality of that and how well it fits. Uh, and then I have a two-part question here. So is this future framework intended to replace RISE or the ANS framework of the past? Keith. Yep, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so if you look at either the RISE framework or the old ANS capability maturity model, uh, both of those don't contain a lot of detail. Both of those are intended as high level, um, high level frameworks to think about elements that you need to have in place. But actually, if you start looking at them in practice, there's not a lot of guidelines and, and, and actual detail underneath those. And when we think about this institutional research data management framework, we are not only thinking of that very high level, what are the big pieces of the puzzle you need to have in place, but also actual um, guidelines and uh, more detailed filling in of different elements that you need under that. So um, this would require, this will actually, um, this actually provide much more detail in, in, in considerations for a university what to have in place. So will they replace them? Uh, um, well, they'll definitely, when setting up this, uh, this institutional research data management framework, we'll definitely use the lessons we've learned from RISE and from using the, the capability maturity model as part of the structuring. Um, uh, the, the, this will be much more detailed and much more useful. I think RISE has, uh, has a very specific purpose, and I think for that purpose it is still useful, as in self-assessing quickly, self-assessing your maturity. Uh, but I think this research, institutional research data management framework will be much more comprehensive and be much more useful to actually inform when you are building your entirety of research data management services and policies and procedures for your university. Thanks, Keith. Um, how will these frameworks consider the record management legislation in each state? Yes, that's part of the reason why you always need to have a framework and a guideline because in Australia we've got the federated system and we always need to acknowledge the, you know, privacy and um, uh, other legislative frameworks and here with the records management of each state will be uh, important. Um, I don't think, with the kind of things that, you know, just give you an example, what we really want to know is, you know, okay, a records management would say that you need to interrogate the value of a record for future use. Uh, I think what we're trying to look at is that that next level of detail that would say, well, uh, what are those, what, from a researcher's point of view, what, what uh, constitutes a valuable record in research data terms? Uh, and how do you recognize that and which disciplinary guidelines would allow you to ask those questions. So I don't think that at that level we'll, we will necessarily bump into um, specific legislative differences. Sometimes they at the very top level there's kind of a statement that says you know destroy stuff after five years or something like that. So uh, some of those statements would um, would intersect but that's not exactly the this Framework is not um, targeted at the same level as legislation. It's meant to be a um, almost like a, a thinking aid uh, for institutions when they're uh, implementing research data management. Thanks. Um, so some related questions. Um, how many participants are we looking for or able to fund? And then will non-funded institutions have access to the progress? Yes, we we have a target. And I noticed that the person who asked this question has something to do with the ARDC. Uh, we will take back to our board uh, the, the total sum that, that, that we intend to invest here. Why I'm, I'm uh, not answering the question directly is that our objective is to get total coverage if possible. Uh, we're not expecting total coverage, so our current budget sort of says that, well, you know, let's see if we can get a considerable coverage of universities. 
but uh, faced with um, uh, high demand, we will go back to the ARDC board and say, look, this is a strategic program and we would like to cover as many universities as, has, as have um, um, applied. At the moment, we, we would, you know, there's about 37 universities in Australia. We would love to get, you know, up towards that 50% mark is where we're hoping for. Uh, and uh, that's what we're kind of planning for. But uh, we, we, our major goal here is actual, actually um, uh, the, the sector being able to move uh, in a direction together. So if we get high demand, we will go back to the ARDC board and do our absolute best to, con to uh, include as many universities as possible. Um, and I think that that also covers, so how are you ensuring that all types of institutions are covered? I think that that, um, yes. Uh, we also have, um, will all institutions that register interest be selected for the consultative workshop? Um, yes, so long as they are eligible institutions, i.e. Australian universities, um, then um, yes, it, we would really love to have every university in Australia register interest and participate in that initial workshop. Um, um, Nicola, sorry, just, just going back to the, the earlier question, there were, there were two parts of that question. The first part was about which universities uh, could join in and how many. The second part of the question was what about other organisations that might want to want to have insight into what is happening in the discussions? Um, I think that's a very interesting question, um, um, and I think the, the framework, the, the development of the framework, uh, it's definitely intended to, to result in a public, a public facing document, something that's not secret or only for partners. This is going to be something that's available to all, uh, all those that are interested in what this institutional research data management framework looks like. Um, how we will involve others uh, that are not actual project partners uh, in the um, uh, in the development of the framework. I, I don't think we have we've, uh, we've, dis, we've decided on that level of detail yet, uh, but it's definitely something we'll keep in mind throughout the process uh, about how we can best ensure that uh, um, there is some visibility in the process and what's happening there. And uh, you know, remembering that the spirit of this is to include as you know uh, the university sector um, so for those universities who for some reason can't participate, we will be, the spirit of this program will be to share the, the, the findings and the outcomes and to be as openly inclusive to those who are formally participating as those who are not formally participating. Um, thanks. So I have two related questions here. Um, the first, what about managing the long tail of data, not part of national collections? Are the management of these data in scope? And then the um, related question, does the framework include consideration of the vast amounts of data that are never made available and also for data produced by individual researchers who may not consider their data be, to be important like big data? So, um Let's start with the long tail, not part of major national collections. Uh, yes, they are in scope. Uh, that's why I said there's a number of objectives here. Uh, there's objectives in these innovation through building national collections, uh, but we do have an, uh, a couple of objectives around systemic fairness of data, meaning availability. Um, so yes, we are. And because we will be partnering with the institutions, the institutions also have um, interest in, in efficient projects, you know, just in having you know, good, good management of, the, of their own activities as well. So uh, yes, those things are uh, certainly in scope. As far as the ARDC is concerned, yes, they're in scope because they represent um, important uh, contributions to integrity and efficiency of the whole national system. There was a second part of that question, is that right, uh, Nicola? 
Uh, yes, um, so talking additionally about, so um, data that are not made available for sharing and data produced by individual researchers who may not consider their data to be important, um, which I think fits into that idea of uh, data that don't form part of major collections. Yes, all of those things are there. And, and of course, when we're saying management of data, it doesn't mean that it, it all needs to be um, public um, during the project, of course, it's just used by the project participants. Some of it at the end of the data of the day may well be um, going to other uh, shareable states. Uh, and that's exactly what the framework is for, is to be able to prepare us to be able to make those decisions. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, while the framework may be technologically agnostic, do you envisage it would help inform decisions around choosing technology to support RDM? Oh, I'm happy for others to talk about that, but look, my, we will be creating an important contribution of this, pro, this program, this collaborative project, is to create, uh, again, conversations between the, the participants uh, to a community of practice, if you like, of, uh, uh, and this will be an important forum for that sharing of information. So I, I ideally hope that those kind of things will be a, a desired side effect of the, of the initiative. Okay, um, I have a question here. Uh, I'd argue that this program is all about all data, not just long tail or short head. All of these have admin overhead and admin overhead is an unfunded problem. So the question is, are you okay with proposals that entirely address the admin problem only? Um, so I suppose to uh, an initial comment from me is that we really aren't um, requiring specific uh, proposals. This is a, a collaborative um, piece of work, but I suppose in terms of uh, implementations that might address only administration. Um, I don't know, Adrian, do you have a, a comment there? Uh, look, the, the outcome we're looking for is, you know, to do with that, uh, this administration is not just administration for its own case, it's uh, ad administering the data, uh, you know, across, the, across its life cycle. So uh, I would say that that's a very important part of uh, part of the, the the framework. And you, if you look at our wording there, we're asking institutions to validate and test elements of the framework. Um, so I can't see why that would be out of scope. Uh how do you envisage coordinating the contributions of 37 universities, each working on a portion of the framework? Will this make it difficult to build a cohesive framework? Yes. <laughs> 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 um, but that's the world we live in, and that's exactly the contribution that ARDC hopes we can make. You know, we really do see ourselves as you know, a research data commons, but in one sense, we are a glue. We're the glue that brings together these kind of collaborative uh, um, initiatives, and that's the world we work in. Um, building consensus, um, building, uh, drawing out the principles that, that that unite, and you know, allowing people to look at things differently where they need to. Uh, that that's exactly the speciality of uh, the ARDC. So we're definitely up for that. Um, look. Uh, from a pragmatic point of view, there is a, a, a 37 organisations could be work. Well, it has three stages. We work on the framework together, and uh, you know, get a consensus there. 37 institutions would be working on different aspects, validating different aspects of it, uh, and would be re informing that uh, back again. So it's not they're not just heading off in 37 directions uh, uh, independently. And then a lot of our work, yes, will be around coordinating. If people are working on several, uh, several organisations are working on the same aspect, uh, then we will be coordinating that kind of activity so that we can um, uh, get a proper learning from that. Brilliant. Um, to what extent 
do you expect to leverage existing good practices versus developing entirely new approaches? Keith, what do you think? Well, certainly in the developing of the framework, that institutional research data management framework, that's where best practices would be great input to show uh, examples of where uh, where elements have already been addressed in a, th in a thorough way. Uh, I expect that as we're developing that framework, we'll come up, we'll already be able to identify some examples of bits that have been done really well. And uh, I think that's great to have that as input. So we're not, we, we don't, we're not starting from scratch, but we can actually pull in elements and bits uh, to, fit, to feed into that institutional research data management framework. When it comes down to a, um, an actual implementation, um, you could take a, you probably wouldn't want to take an existing best practice example as an implementation, but rather maybe a change to an existing best practice or to change, turn something that is a good practice into a best practice. So um, that's where using best practices, uh, I think, uh, can be also be really useful. I hope that answers the question. And I think um, that that is all of the questions I have here at the moment, unless anyone has anything else they'd like to ask. Uh, now, if we have uh, missed your question, I'll be going through these questions and um, adding them to our FAQ document along with the answers. Um, so if there's anything that we've missed here, it will be answered there. No, I think, I think that that's it. Good, then uh, unless there are no other questions, we will, uh, what's the next step, Nicola? The, what kind of action would you like people to take after this uh, webinar? Um, I would love uh, for people to, um, to discuss this program with uh, the relevant um, parties within their institution um, and then uh, participate in this, uh, the initial uh, registration of interest, which will open next week. Uh, so you can find all the information about that on our website. Um, brilliant. Um, all right. Thank you very much, everyone. And thanks very much to Nicola and Keith. Oh, and one, one small practical thing on Nicola's, uh, the, the registration of interest, I guess, does not actually um, um, oblige you to to put in a proposal in the end so you could register your interest yes. even if you're not sure and then take it from there is that correct and definitely and um for instance if you uh, aren't sure if you'd like to um formally apply but you would like to be involved in that initial workshop um we're very keen for that as well if you'd like to register your interest be involved in that workshop and have your views heard there but then um decide not to go any further that's um we'd en encourage that even um Yes, thanks, Keith. And uh, is there, uh, how would people, if they have any further questions, what, what should they do, Nicole? Uh, there's a contact email, um, which again, um, you can find at the bottom of the website, but I believe it's uh, inquiries at ardc.edu.au. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, that's all on, the, on that webpage. Great. All right, thank you very much. We look forward to working with everyone on this really inspiring initiative. Bye-bye.